Chapter 54, Community Ecology. So here's a community, and we're going to define the other level, levels of um, ecology so that you understand where the community fits. So this is an individual organism. And if you have a bunch of those of the same species living in the same area, we call that a population. So it might be a population of elk. A community would be that population plus all of the other populations in the area. So it would include all of the um, members of the moose population, all of the um, rabbits, all of the owls, all of the um, different types of pine trees, all of the insects, all of the grass, all of the um, different types of birds. That would be the community. It's all of the biotic factors. So bio means life, meaning it's all the living things in this area. An ecosystem is all of that plus the abiotic stuff. So it's the biotic factors plus the abiotic factors. So when you put an A in front of something, it means not. So this is the living stuff plus the non-living stuff. So the community plus the water, the air, um, the rocks, whatever else is in the um, community that's not living, and that would be the ecosystem. A biome is just a really big ecosystem. We studied these in chapter 42. It would be stuff like a coniferous forest, um, a tundra, taiga, grassland, that kind of thing. A biosphere is um, bio meaning life. Sphere is the ball shaped, well, the planet. And so this is all of the areas of the planet where living things can exist. So the land, the water, down into the soil as far as bacteria um, can live. Um, up into the air for as far as um, anything can fly or, or float. So again, biological community is all of the populations of various species living close enough to um, interact with each other. So here's a sea urchin and um, a crab, and they're interacting with each other. Um, the crab is actually carrying the sea urchin around. So when we look at those kinds of interactions, we can define them um, in a few different ways, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of the chapter on. So let's define this first, interspecific interactions. So specific means species, and inter means between. So these are interactions between different species. So between the clownfish and the sea anemone, for example. And so different interactions between different species um, can include competition between them when they fight for things, predation, um, herbivory, symbiosis, the symbiosis, could include uh, parasitism or mutualism or commensalism. And then there's also this thing called facilitation. For these, we're going to define them in terms of being positive for one or both species, negative for them, or having no effect on them. So we're going to start with um, competition. Competition is um, one of the more straightforward ones because you deal with competition all the time. Like who is going to get the best grade on this ecology test, right? That would be intra specific competition because you're all trying to fight for that A plus, right? Um, Inter-specific com competition would be the lion here with the hyena, um, all fighting for whatever it is that the lion caught. So that's a minus minus interaction, meaning the lion has to spend energy fighting for its food and the hyena has to spend energy fighting to try to get the food. And so they're both spending energy fighting each other instead of trying to get food. And one of them um, is gonna end up not getting the food. And the last point here is the more similar the needs of the species, the more um, intense the competition. So here's an example of that. Scientists grew this protist separately, and you can see it kind of started with very few, and then it increased. We'll talk about this type of population growth later. Um, and then it kind of balances off around carrying capacity. Same thing happened with this other protist. So we have P. caudatum and P. Ra. Aurelia. Um, if you grow them both together, one starts out doing a little bit better, but then the other one outcompetes them. And then this one um, ends up dying. So that's called competitive ex oops. That's called competitive exclusion. That's um, a vocab term that I want you to know. So it means that when you have really strong competition, typically one is going to exclude the other. So one of them will die out or become extinct in that particular location. So the competitive exclusion principle states that two species competing for the same limiting resource can't coexist in the same place. They might exist in different places, so it wouldn't be total extinction, it would just be um, extinction in that particular area. We need to define this idea of the 
ecological niche or niche. So the niche is the total of the species use of biotic and abiotic resources. What that really means is the job of the organism. So it's not just where it lives, it's what it does. So what you eat, um, when you're awake, where you live, um, you know, do you live in a tree or on the ground? So here are two different um, lizards and one of them lives down lower and the other one lives up higher. And so they eat very similar um, organisms and they do very similar kind of things, but because one lives a little higher and one lives a little lower, they can occupy the same general area. Which brings us to this idea of resource partitioning. So that's the differentiation of ecological niches, enabling similar species to coexist in a community. So you don't have one excluding or killing off the other. So here's species one and here's species two. And we're gonna assume that species one is the stronger competitor. So these are sizes of seeds and species one eats mainly kind of smallish to medium seeds. And species two eats bigger seeds, but also kind of moderate size seeds. And if they live in different areas, species two will eat seeds that you know get fairly small. So seeds from this size all the way up to pretty big ones. If they're living in the same area, that means they're fighting for or competing for the medium-sized seeds. And so th since this one is a stronger competitor, the species two folks that are that have um, that are better adapted at eating the the medium-sized seeds, they're not going to grow up and make as many babies. And so after um, a certain number of generations, you're actually not going to have species two in this part of the niche at all. So this one is really excluding this one from this portion of the niche. So that's resource partitioning. Species two ends up evolving to um, utilize different resources than species one. So they'll end up not having an overlap at all. A very similar idea, fundamental niche versus realized niche. Fundamental is your basic niche that you could have if there's no one else competing. So if you look at um, this barnacle, I'm not going to even try to pronounce that one. Here's a barnacle. It lives in the intertidal zone, and it can live from here to here. And so this is the whole range that it's able to live. If it has this other one, here's this other type of barnacle. This one is a better competitor. And so if that's living here, then this one can only live in this area. So this entire range would be the fundamental niche. That means this is the area that um, this guy, this barnacle is adapted for if there's nobody else fighting for the area. Since this guy is a better competitor, um, it's, it takes over in this area. So that means this guy, the barnacle that starts with C here, can only live in this area up here. So this is the realized niche. This is the spot that, um, this is the, the niche that this particular um, barnacle actually does occupy. So in real life, this is what it looks like. Scientists did an experiment where they took out all of the uh, balanus, all these blue ones, and um, the results are that the um, this barnacle that had only lived up here before, it took over you know, this whole area. So this barnacle is limiting the niche of this one. And that's because of competition. Um, here's a, another um, type of resource partitioning. You can have not just the size of the seeds, for example, you can have this thing called um, temporal partitioning. So temporal means time. Uh, here are two different types of um, mice, and mostly they are nocturnal, which means they are active at night. And um, when they live in the same area, this one actually becomes diurnal. It actually becomes active during the day. So in this particular case, when they're living at the same area at the same time, this one has evolved to um, stay up during the day. So now it has a different niche and it's able to survive. It's not that it tried to, it's that the ones who were able to do that were successful. It is just as likely that this one would have gone extinct in this particular area. So natural selection doesn't always produce this type of partitioning. It just sometimes produces this type of partitioning when some of the organisms um, are lucky and end up being able to survive using different resources in the um, environment. Here's another very closely related um, idea, character displacement. This is the tendency for characteristics to be more divergent, more different in sympatric populations. That, that's 
like this. So sympatric populations mean when they're living together, um, as opposed to allopatric populations when they're living apart. So if you're looking at um, these fish, let's say there's two different species, because if, if they're very similar species and they eat the same kinds of things, you're going to end up getting one of the species to be a different size or somehow use different resources um, in the environment. Because if it doesn't, it'll die out. And so you don't always get character displacement. Um, what you might get instead is extinction. But in some cases, you'll end up with character displacement. If these folks are living in different, oops, if they're living in totally different lakes than the other guys, they might end up looking a whole lot alike. Yet this is the same species as this, and this one's the same species as this. Here's another example. These are um, finches, I guess. Um, yep, Galapagos finches. And um, so these are two different species of finch. This one has a, a fairly small beak, and this one has a pretty big beak. Um, on one particular island, this particular finch um, eats um, seeds of a certain size and it ends up having a beak that's, you know, whatever, uh, 9 to 11 um, millimeters. And this one is very, very close. It's a little bit of a bigger beak, but not, a, not, not way, way different. When they happen to end up on the same island, these folks... Um, end up with a smaller beak and these folks end up with a bigger beak. And so what's happened is those um, organisms of these species who end up using the same resources tend to not do super well and they don't make as many babies. Of these, the ones with the bigger beaks end up having more food around because they're not competing with these folks. And these, the ones with smaller beaks um, who aren't competing with these, are going to end up making more babies. So you end up with, after many generations, having um, mainly smaller beaks in these folks and mainly larger beaks in these folks. But they haven't diverged so much that the ones from this island couldn't mate with the ones from that island or the ones from this island, um, again, could still mate with the ones from that island. So that's called character displacement. It might not happen. Instead, one of them might outcompete the other one. And the, so one of the two might be excluded and die off. Um, but it's just one of the things that can happen.